for inviting me. Um, I've learned a lot this morning, um, but I did something I tell my students never to do, is I sat back there and I started switching my slides around uh, because I heard some things and I was like, oh, maybe this should be interesting with this group. It could really give me some insight. So it's gonna come across a little less poised than I wanted, but this is such a great opportunity to have all these people sort of look at some of the data that maybe goes outside the box of just the, the parent report. But I'll start with that, but then I'm gonna tag on some other data too. Uh, Okay, so just to give an oversight, this is an ongoing study at the University of Chicago. I work with Dr. David Frim as a neuropsych neurosurgeon. Um, we're seeing people who are coming into the clinic. We call them ahead of time. We tell them about the study. Um, then we set up a neuropsych evaluation. Um, at the same time, the students being or the patient is being evaluated. The parent is also completing a clinical interview and completing some questionnaires about sort of mental health, medical health. Um, and also some questionnaires about emotional functioning uh, and quality of life and daily activity. Uh, the neuropsych battery takes about three hours, sometimes four, depending on the, the child. And the interview with the parent takes usually an hour clinical interview and then probably about 40 minutes of filling out questionnaires when they're waiting for their child. So it's a morning appointment, basically. Uh, and the goal of that is to hit the very specific domains at the beginning. So we had talked about the IQ being one of those elements that we wanted to look at. Memory, emotional functioning, uh, executive functioning, and, and visual spatial. So sort of the, the general domains that we do in most of our neurocognitive batteries. Uh, this is the uh, current... I think the most, a little, maybe we have a few more now. I think we're up to like 100, but there's 86 children. These are all children. Uh, mean age is 11, uh, equally divided in terms of boys and girls. Uh, in terms of handedness, there's, it pretty much reflects the general population. Um, it is atypically Caucasian. I'm on the south side of Chicago, so that's a, a pretty surprising, but I guess maybe that says something about genetics that you guys can tell me about. Um, in terms of estimated household income, um, it is also a little bit of a upper middle class sort of population that we're seeing who are coming in for care and malformation evaluations. Uh, age and, um, diagnosis was seven years, and um, about 11% of the family members also had some form of care and malformation also. So one of the first things we do is we ask the parents after filling out the medical questionnaires to fill out this questionnaire about uh, the brief rating um, form, which is a questionnaire that looks at um, cognitive functioning in the very specific uh, domain of executive functioning. Um, in this case, I'm going to be talking about the parent form, but there is also a teacher form and a self form. Um, it, it's uh, nice because it has a validity measure sort of built in, and then you could break it down into um, like a general global uh, executive composite score, and then also behavioral regulation, which involves more like emotional control, shifting your attention, concentration, initiating, and then metacognition, which is more of the neurocognitive aspects of executive control initiating, having working memory, planning your space, keeping your things organized in your house or in your bedroom, um, and sort of self-monitoring your behavior as it relates to other children or when you're playing. Um, when we look at this population first, I think we have to talk about some comorbidities, and I think this was sort of interesting based on some of that imaging that was talked about earlier, um, because probably 43% um, of our population is reporting some difficulty during their pregnancy. Preclampsia, some difficulties actually with the uh, delivery itself, some issues with an ultrasound that they were told to do bed rest. Um, about 25% of our children, so one in four, is actually born premature. Um, and about a third of the children have some developmental delay, walking, talking, or toileting. Um, in terms of the major physical issue that they're concerned about, um, headaches was the first complaint the, chill, uh, um, excuse me, the child reported. Um, also gait disturbance, pain, um, and swallowing difficulties were the main physical issues. These are some, some little bit more in-depth descriptions of the questionnaire and sort of how we break down each of these different domains. 
If we look at the domains, basically what we're seeing is that the majority of patients are doing fairly well across most aspects of executive functioning, except for working memory and initiation and planning. So they're having significant difficulties in these areas per patient, patient's parent report. So if we, if we look at it as a group, a lot of the scores can be in the average to high average range, but if we break it down a little bit and we look at the percent impaired, we're seeing some pretty high rates of impairment. So in terms of working memory, the ability to hold on to information online, you know, go do that, come back, almost half the children are, are not doing very well with that according to their parents. There's also probably one in three are having some difficulties with initiating. Parents are reporting some difficulties also with shifting, switching what they're doing, whether that be cognitively or emotionally, having some difficulties with sort of emotional regulation and being able to shift to the demands of the environment. This is some of the items that goes with working memory. Easily distracted, has trouble with chores, needs help from adults, um, uh, difficulty finishing tasks. What's sort of interesting is other researchers have shown that um, children who have problems on working memory often have difficulties in math and reading at school. So there's a high correlation of having your parents sort of mark that this is a problem and then struggling and making academic gains. So we, we sort of said, okay, there's these subtle sort of executive difficulties that the parents are reporting. What, why? You know, what, we, what could we sort of tie them to? Um, one of the things that we found is that this certainly seemed to correlate with um, headaches seemed to be something that which sort of makes sense. If someone's having a headache, they're going to have some difficulties focusing, staying on task. The other, though, were also gait disturbance um, and some difficulty with swallowing, which is unclear as... This just a, a general, un, I'm uncomfortable, or is it a marker of the amount of brain involvement? Which I can't really tell right now. So that was based on the parents just sort of filling out a questionnaire. So then we went back and said, well, how many of these are having actually psychiatric diagnoses? How many actually meet the criteria of attention deficit disorder, um, depression, anxiety? Um, and we had, um, pretty high rates. So when you think about the rates, most of the rates for anxiety, depression, and ADHD are below, they're usually single digits, so it's pretty shocking that ADHD is 22%, depression is 10, anxiety is 12, um, and even Asperger's, that's a little bit high, 3.5% of the population of the group is reporting having been diagnosed with one of these psychiatric conditions. What was also interesting is we asked the parents, had you ever been diagnosed with anything? Did you have a problem with depression? Did you have a problem with um, ADHD? Uh, one of the reasons why also, one, genetics. Two, also what treatment, what medications were they on during their pregnancy? Um, this wasn't a predictor of the child's psychiatric history, though. It did not actually predict that like we anticipated. Uh, but there were certainly high rates. Might reflect burden of being a, a parent of a child with you know, an uncontrollable and sometimes difficult medical condition. And those are some pretty high rates. And to, like the, we also have to take care of our, our families too, and they're suffering a little bit too, this suggests. Um, I looked at sort of what are some other sort of predictors of who has a psychiatric diagnosis. Uh, one of the biggest predictors was um, some type of pregnancy problem. That means whether they had preeclampsia, whether they were told to get bed rest because of something on an ultrasound, whether there was something in the original, um, the method of um, delivery, where it was supposed to be cesarean or not. Um, and that actually was the biggest predictor of someone's later psychiatric illness. In fact, you're eight times more likely to have a psychiatric diagnosis if you had some type of early neurodevelopmental problem, right, if you had some difficulty during the pregnancy itself. Prematurity improved the model, the predictive model of which of the children would have a psychiatric problem and which wouldn't. And seizures did up too, but not a whole lot. The biggest predictor was early prenatal sort of complications or difficulties. Um, none of the other ones that we looked at 
really made a big difference. Pseudotumor cerebri, having a prior um, mild TBI or concussion, um, they were not predictors. They didn't help the model in any way of predicting who would have a psychiatric problem. Um, there's a whole literature, a growing literature, of looking at the cerebellum in psychiatric diseases. Um, the cerebellum is, uh, does a rapid amount of uh, development in the third sem um, trimester. So um, is there something that's going on there at that point? Is there some other type of just whole brain you know, miss sort of uh, development at that period that maybe is explaining this versus just the Chiari, or is it the Chiari itself? I'm, I'm not really sure. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. It sort of fits with some people, I think we're talking about the cerebellar affective syndrome being something that maybe needs to be talked about within this group. Um, it is a period where the brain is sort of very vulnerable. And there's some DTI imaging that shows the peduncles, which I think someone else showed on a DTI study that the middle peduncles um, are altered in people with um, carrying malformations, and that certainly also has been implicated in attention deficit disorder, anxiety, and Asperger's, so that's sort of a, also interesting sort of correlate that needs to be sort of thought about in all this. So going back to um, more of the cognitive data, I looked at sort of how these, um, how the parents' report of cognitive difficulties impacted true cognitive performance. And in fact, it was pretty good. The uh, parents were able to, their report of having difficulties in working memory really um, correlated very highly with the child's difficulties on the learning tasks and also highly correlated with um, problems with sustained attention. The CAST does things like, it's like a trail making test, a stroop test, so processing speed, mental flexibility, sustained attention, and that seemed to correlate with the parents' report of difficulties in these areas, which surprised me because that often doesn't happen in a good way. Um, so then I, I wanted to look further for this executive dysfunction within our, our sort of battery. And overall, our patients really do look well. This is overall IQ, average range. But if you dig a little deeper, there is a verbal IQ, PIQ split, and it's, it is significant. So patients do better on verbal comprehension. They do a little bit worse when it's requiring visual spatial integration, block designs, matrix reasoning, using more spatial integration, sort of knowledge rather than factual knowledge. This is the entire uh, database. Um, it's probably bigger now, but this is that. And you'll see the majority of patients as a whole actually do do very well. As I said, IQ's average, verbal memory as a whole is average, uh, verbal learning is average. The thing that is sort of a little bit lower, and the biggest one that's low, is the construction. So that's the Ray complex figure. That's when you're shown a figure. You don't know it's a memory test. You're told just to copy the figure. Come back three minutes later and we say, could you draw that for me again? So it's an incidental memory test. It's not explicit. It's sort of the idea someone mentions something to you. Can you really remember it 10 minutes later? Or you know, do you have to be told explicitly to remember it? So it's a real sensitive measure of difficulties with working memory and sort of new learning, the real life learning that goes on when people mention things to you and you gotta follow up with it. And those patients really sort of had some difficulty with the original um, uh, recall of that, the delayed recall, but even the original copy, they really did horribly on the original copy. Um, Probably about a month ago, I had a young girl from uh, Spain contact me to come work with us at University of Chicago, and she has 78, no, she has like 88, I think, children uh, and controls, and she has the same exact data. Her data shows that IQ is pretty much okay, except for nonverbal IQ is a little bit lower. Memory is pretty good, except for sort of the upfront complex construction spatial planning. That's a little bit lower too. Language seems to be okay. The basics of some aspects of executives seem to be okay, except for the planning and the spatial integration that's involved with visual spatial tasks. It just seems to be a pretty consistent finding. So, I don't know if anyone knows the ray, but it doesn't look like that. But that's the typical ray that I get from the children. And the idea is it's supposed to be a nice, ooh, a nice little box. It's supposed to have lines through it. It's supposed to look pretty. Yet we don't see that often with our children. And the biggest thing I notice is they lose the gestalt. 
If you lose the gestalt, it's a much more difficult task, right? Because most people say, well, I see a box, and I see four little boxes. They don't see that, and it, it becomes just a mishmash, and they have to remember every little part of it. And it's sort of interesting. And you look at sort of, uh, this is, I know there's some animal lovers in the group, and I remember reading this study about the cerebellum playing a role with uh, birds and how they do a nest and how they nest. And, and there's a lot of researching with rat you know, animal studies that have to do with um, spatial integration is really activated in the cerebellum when people are doing rat sort of mazes. And that's another sort of question of does the cerebellum or pathways out of the cerebellum have something to do with why these kids with Chiari are a little bit behind or is it more just the general prematurity that's going on. There's a whole literature looking at childhood disorders and most of these children do show visual spatial and sort of processing speed sort of difficulties and especially the more executive integration spatial problems. Some people have been looking at this a little bit, took the ray and broke it down a little bit and said what does it really involve? It's pretty complex. There's a higher level motor, sorry, that's supposed to be motor control. There is this sort of visual motor transformation component, which is more sort of parietal sensory. And then there's this multi-step object use network. So you have to sort of have your object, but you've got to plan it out. And that's more left frontal, cerebellum, and the fusiform, which is sort of involved with facial recognition too, which is sort of cool. Um, but it's sort of interesting that you know, that might be a pathway of why these children are having some difficulties with these complex, whether it's block design, visual um, matrices, complex visual drawings. So then we said, well, let's, let's go see if we can predict some things. Um, so I said the, the visual recall construction looked terrible. What could be some predictors? Could it be prematurity? Could it be that some of our children had decompression? Was it the fact that they had high rates of headaches? Was it the fact that they had developmental delay? And I looked at the, the ray complex figure and I also looked at the CAS attention measure. And I found a, sort of a trend, uh, not significant overall, 0.08, but decided to go digging anyway and, and found that Frequent headaches actually was the thing that did predict the visual sort of difficulty. I'm not quite sure what that means in terms of is this really um, just because I have a headache, I can't draw well, or is something about having a headache also playing a part in sort of this constructional, is there a CSF flow issue causing the headaches, causing stretching of these, these white matter tracks coming out of the, the, the cerebellar sort of network back there? But it's sort of an interesting uh, finding. Uh, looking further, um, I don't think any, anything else was very significant in terms of predicting um, who was doing well in the attention test and who wasn't. Um, so then I went and, and looked at, uh, this is what I added to, to this morning down here. So um, we had 41 scans by a radiologist uh, I asked one of the radiology fellows, and then he went to the chair at the time, who I think was Kumar, and they collaborated on this data. Uh, so based on what I heard today, I might change some of the methodology here, but this is the, the data that we have today. Uh, we also had uh, some examination using uh, phase contrast CSF flow dynamics, uh, and also wanted to look at with that, and I just because we had such a small sample, we just put it into a yes-no sort of box, and yes, you had, we found some findings of that, or no, we didn't, at least not notable ones. And then we wanted to look at cognition based on that. And what we found was that um, the this sort of ratio did really predict quite strongly this visual spatial sort of integration problem that was seen on the IQ measure. Um, and also, um, had some prediction with the, with the attention difficulties that the patients were seeing. So there was a direct correlation of the worse that was, the worse they did on the, the PRI of the IQ measure, and the worse they did on some of the attention measures. 
when I went back and looked at the CSF flow data, but again, that was a really um, rough, dirty way of doing it, yes or no. Uh, and that turned out not to at least be in this model, which probably what I heard today might not be the greatest model, but um, didn't seem to really affect attention or visual recall. So my last slides that I threw in here was looking at uh, decompression surgery. Um, we just wanted to look at if patients, this, these are not matched, so we just looked at a group of patients who had decompression and a group who hadn't, and what did they look like now? We're doing, we're following people now, but this is the rough pre-trial, I guess. Um, and basically, um, there was no demographic differences between those who had surgery and those who had not received surgery yet, um, so that wouldn't explain anything. We also then, you know, didn't find any difference in terms of memory. There was no difference in memory. There was no difference even in the, while it's still impaired in terms of the visual spatial data, it, it was no more impaired before surgery than after surgery. So the surgery doesn't uh, help, but it doesn't hurt either. So if they had problems ahead of time, they really continue to have the problems afterwards. And remember, these are people who, at this point, it has, um, the illness for a while and eventually during critical periods um, that might not bounce back so quickly. This was surgery. Sometimes I think the mean age was three years. Um, so over time that may improve, but at the time they're not any better than they were cognitively pre-surgery. All right, so overall um, we found that there's a little bit higher rate of anxiety than depression, but both higher than the population, the general population extremely elevated rates of attention deficit disorder with the patients and the family members, uh, although the family members' uh, history did not predict the patient's history. In terms of cognition, overall IQ is in the average range, as are most cognitive abilities, but there are deficits in visual spatial constructional skills, um, perceptual reasoning, attention, and then visual memory. Uh, predictors, uh, it's unclear. Uh, certainly, headaches seem to be something that correlates with the parents' report and with some of our actual neurocognitive data. So what that means is unclear. As I said, some of our methodology with CSF flow data probably needs to be tweaked quite a bit. Uh, but we did also see that decompression surgery probably did not have a big effect on memory, at least in this sort of quasi sample that we're using. Oh. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lacey, for this interesting presentation. Uh, questions? It's interesting that Frank said that cerebellum is severely bounded and that you're connecting probably most of the problems with cerebellar structures. It, it certainly could be. You know, it, it's sort of, as we're saying, um, there's lots of tracks out there. There's a big literature suggesting in other diseases that the cerebellum has a role in neuropsychiatric presentations and some um, cerebellar affective and some executive difficulties. Yeah, the question is then, uh, you don't see the relation with the CSF flow, uh, but I'm not sure how that was measured and how that would relate with the cerebellar. I mean, may, maybe this cerebellar mechanical properties that should be correlated with, or attempted to be correlated with uh, psychological problems, no? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, I'm going to walk away with here with doing exactly that. I think that's exactly what I think needs to be done, and I think doing it in a slightly different way, may especially tease out the whole headache role. I'm assuming that's going to be the marker of headaches? Is that is that right? I see some shaking heads, yes or no? Or? Well, we, we, we don't know what the, okay. uh, the strain that we're going to correlate. We have no, I mean, we certainly are hopeful that it will indicate it. We have no preliminary data. It's not easy to get it. Okay. Yeah, not a single statistic data we have. Okay. It's just measured. Good, good, though. Maureen, did any of these people um, talk about um, the problems with conceiving, like that they had IVF or that they had additional hormone therapy? Oh, you mean during get, getting pregnant? Mm -hmm. um, 
You know, I, I, I can go, I didn't look at that. Um, we looked at once they were pregnant. Um, but I could go back, we might have that data in there. Uh, but definitely um, during the pregnancy was a big factor. Carried a lot of power. Which, you know, prematurity is, has its own data. There's a whole research on what premature brains and how vulnerable they are. So. Uh, I might add that Jeremy Schmalman has told me a couple of times that he thinks it, the cognitive effects are due to damage in the cerebellum, more so than fiber tracts coming outside. Um, I was very intrigued by your, your Ray Osterite uh, figure there. Uh, yeah. Could we go back sure. and look at that, if that's okay? Absolutely. Sorry, I know it's yeah. way too much there. It's all right. But is it a problem Motor? With the pieces, or is it the problem with the gestalt? The, uh, Most of the pieces are there. Yeah. It looks to me like it's a holistic integration. Yeah, it's sort of like the, the nesting. Yeah, I mean, like so they, I had never, the I'm good not ones, a neo-gestaltist, so I find that very intriguing that I've never um, oh, thought it's, of that. It's, that looks like a classic case of um, holistic deficit. Yeah, some that? people would say yeah. it's like right hemisphere yeah. damage. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. The whole is different than the sum of its parts. In the classic experiment, uh, Nickerson asked a group of people at your institution, by the way, yeah, to decide what direction the face on pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters were. They were a chance. Now, no one has a problem with sorting those. So they know what the, the, the general gist of the image is. We look at faces as a unitary whole, but don't know the size of the eyes or where the nose is or the mouth. They know where all the parts are, but they don't know the relations among the parts. And so it's a holistic deficit of how the pieces fit together. And, and that goes with your cerebellar comment, not just so much yeah. coming out of the cerebellum. That's one part of it, but the other maybe what the cerebellum does itself, the organizational part of that, and the I mean, logic the of that. fusiform face area. Right, that's what they were yeah. saying, so right? The fusiform is, yeah. is involved in facial sort of yeah. simultaneous, things like that, right? So it's an interesting. Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, was your <coughs> group of uh, patients the entire uh, group, or were they volunteers who uh, said, we will go through this testing? Um, they, they were volunteers, yes. Yeah, so so it, 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 there's a certain selection bias in, in that regard. I, I would say yes. I'm trying to figure out how to answer this in a way without. Um, oftentimes, people spend a lot of time at the university waiting for different you know, things to happen. So uh, they often will do it because they're waiting around, too. It's That's not just yes or no. And, uh, and your post-operative uh, analysis, how soon after decompressive surgery? That was uh, average one year, that group. At one year. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We're having this little side talk about this um, to bring up the issue of you know, looking at the non-operative patients here would be really important. You know, because the big family question is, you know, is intervening earlier in some way going to make a difference? And if we intervene too late, is that why memory's not getting better? You know, yeah. if, you, if you start relating this, yeah. then you have to keep going and say, yeah. well, okay, if the symptoms are more mild, maybe you can reverse them. Can you comment on that? And if you're looking well, at a non-operative goal? Yeah. We're not. I guess we, we can. Um, I can say that everything I've run so far, um, surgery doesn't seem to have a big impact on cognition right now, at least within a year. Um, I can say, yeah, just sort of that, like not doing anything, does that make you worse? That I can't answer yet. So that we could look at though, yeah. But having the surgery certainly doesn't hurt you. It might help you. Which is a big factor. I mean, they, parents want to hear that data. They want to hear, like, okay, so the group who had the surgery don't look any worse than the ones who had it? No, they don't. You know, I feel a little bit better about that if it was my child. Well, thank you. This is uh, great work. I'm also very intrigued by the findings in the complex um, yeah. figure test. Mm -hmm. um, 
and what I was going to ask you is, one, in one slide you said 80% had like problems with math and reading, right? So was that reported by school performance? Oh. And then what does it tell you and does that somehow correlate with what you found in that um, complex figure test? Yeah. Is so that was a that problem? Yeah. So there's certainly, um, that was that was actually just uh, not my data, data from other people who show that patients who have difficulties in working memory have difficulties or much more likely to have difficulties in math in school. Um, and that has probably more to do with a lot of our math problems are sort of in our head. You know, you're calculating, you have to hold and you have to focus and, you know, do multiplication, do division, things like that, and hold the concept online. Some of it, you know, the more, um, advanced mathematics certainly have, we think, a more spatial component to them, and that those patients tend to sort of struggle probably in high school. But I could look at that, though. What about insight? 80%. Yeah, extremely high. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, if you can't really focus, you, you can't really, you have problem, math, the biggest problem with math problems with kids is mistakes by like a point or two. They're, they're not staying really focused on the details. So if your working memory's off, your attention's off, you're going to have more mistakes. But would these so, kids do better, like the kids with ADHD who are on medications? You know, like, so, like, I don't see many of the kids with Chiari's coming yeah. in on, yeah. you know, Focalin or things like that. Mm -hmm. So, it's well, my, my data suggests that 20 yeah, right. plus are, are getting that diagnosis and, and, like, by a psychiatrist on that. Can I, I the part reads, which is 1,400 patients, we have the exact same number. It's around 20%. 20%, yeah. That's uh, not big number. I'm, I'm, that's yeah. one of my memory. But that's pretty comparable, I think, when you think of like other chronic, I think epilepsy has a high rate of uh, ADHD too, so interesting. Are there any, uh, any influence on bi bilingual children in terms of math or dysfunction in general? Do you have uh, any bilingual? I was trying to think, very few, I want to say like 3%. Um, which is which is a little bit of that first one about most of our Caucasians and upper sort of middle class. So surprising being, I don't know if that's an access to healthcare that lower SES don't get an MRI as often or don't know to seek this type of treatment, um, but it, it is definitely some type of access to healthcare bias, I think. Thank you very much. That was fascinating.